Well, good morning again. The title of this morning's lesson is a question. Does a faithful Christian bounce in and out of God's grace all day long? Uh, two weeks ago, we ended our gospel meeting with a lesson by Brother Eric Owens entitled, Can I Know That I'm Going to Heaven? And quite a few individuals talked to me afterwards uh, about that question. And uh, I, some of you have asked questions amongst yourself and been talking about that topic. And you might remember the illustration that Eric gave uh, describing the way that many in the church have misunderstood walking in the light over the years and how Christians seem to just bounce all day long in and out of God's grace, lost, saved, lost, saved all day long. Uh, so Eric illustrated this by uh, walking back and forth from one side of the podium to the other side to represent being saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost all day long. So standing over on the right side of the podium, Eric came over and he said, you know, as I start my day over here in the light and I start in a saved condition, I'm in the light, but then I sin. And then Eric walked around from the right side of the podium over to the left side and he said, now I'm lost. And I'm separated from God. And I have no hope of heaven until I repent of my sin and I come back over here to the light. And he walked over to the right side of the podium. And he said, now I'm, now, now I'm lost, or separated from God. I have no hope of heaven until I come back to the light. So then I prayed to God. I admitted my wrongs. I repent. Now I'm saved again. Uh, and he walked over to the right side of the podium. He said, well, several hours later, I found myself stumbling into another sin. I transfer from light, and then I go back into darkness, and I'm over here, and I'm lost again. And he walked back and forth over and over several times from this side of the podium to that side of the podium, depicting how many Christians view their daily walk as a bouncing in and out of God's grace all day long every day. Uh, losing your salvation, gaining your salvation over and over again in one day. When Eric said that he believed that this was not according to the truth, uh, many of our listeners voiced some concern in the days that followed about the topic, wondering about the implications of what Eric just said and if it was true. I myself wanted to look further into the fundamentals surrounding this question, this all-important question. So in preparation for this lesson, I did some major study, I really dove into this question and the fundamentals around it. I looked at different scripture. I reached out to some sound brethren that we know, um, and I asked about their understanding on this topic. I was able to talk on the phone with Stephen Rogers, someone we know here very well. Um, our India missionary, Don Iverson, I had a phone conversation with him. I read a commentary by Brother uh, Wayne Jackson on this topic. I listened to a sermon by Brother Don Blackwell titled, Can I Know That I Am Saved?, which you can find on YouTube. And I also listened to a sermon by Brother Guy in Woods. I was actually surprised there was an audio lesson on it. Um, interestingly enough, all of these brothers came down on the same side of this question and the fundamentals of this question. And I studied from the scripture these verses that were talked about. So first, I would like to clarify the question of our lesson with focus on the phrase, faithful Christian. Right? You will notice I put it up there in bold. Does a faithful Christian bounce in and out of God's grace all day long? That's our question. Very quickly, since much of what we're going to be studying in a little bit comes from 1 John, uh, which addresses this very subject, I want to give you this book's description of the category of person that we're talking about, the category of person that's in question here. So how does 1 John itself describe the type of person who we're talking about in this question? Let me give you John's description of a faithful person, faithful Christian throughout his book. Starting with 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, John describes the faithful as Christians, not walking in darkness, but walking in light. Right? That denotes a lifestyle. In the same verse, he says, Christians fellowshipping God and fellowshipping the brethren. Verse 9, Christians who confess their sins when they fall short. That's an important one we're going to talk about. They're continually confessing their sins when they fall short. Next, Christians who do not seek after sin. 
find more in chapter 2 and verse 3. Christians who know Jesus and keep his commandments. Christians who keep God's word. Uh, Christians who walk just as Jesus walked. Christians who love the brethren. Christians who know the Father. Christians who are strong and abide in God's word. Christians who have overcome the wicked one. Christians who do not love the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. Christians with confidence in Christ's coming. Christians who will not be ashamed at Christ's coming. Christians who practice righteousness. Christians who are called children of God. Chapter 3 and verse 3. Christians who keep themselves pure like Jesus. All right, this isn't a willful sinner. This isn't a lifestyle of sin. Someone who keeps himself pure like Jesus. Christians who do not continue in sin. Christians who cannot continue in sin because God's seed remains in them. Christians who love one another. Chapter 3 and verse 15. Uh, Christians who have eternal life abiding in them. Christians who lay down their lives for the brethren. Christians who tend the needs of others. Christians who keep God's commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Christians who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians who confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Christians who have overcome the wicked of this world. Christians who are of God. Chapter 4, verse 18. Christians who have overcome fear. Christians who keep God's commandments. Christians who have faith. Christians who have the Son of God in their possession. This list is getting long. We're almost done. Um, Christians who have eternal life in their possession. Christians who do not keep sinning. Christians, lastly, who keep themselves and the wicked one does not touch them. So as we begin this lesson with this question, who is the subject of our question this hour? Well, it's the faithful Christian. It's not an unfaithful Christian, someone who's strayed from the truth, uh, who might bounce in and out of the faith years in their life because uh, you know they won't come to services for six months and they'll live in sin and not even be attached to the church whatsoever. They won't be confessing their sins. We're not talking about a Christian who has fallen away. They'll leave and come back over and over, and, it, and it's just a cycle of in and out of God's grace because that's the way their lifestyle. So uh, we're talking about being faithful. So what happens when a faithful Christian who is, quote, walking in the light, as we just talked about, what happens when they sin living the faithful lifestyle? So let me, uh, let me set the scene for you by giving you my version of this illustration. Okay, Eric used the podium. I'm going to put it up here. Let's talk about a day in the life of a faithful Christian. What I have for you here is what some might call a typical day in the life of a faithful Christian. I'll start by giving you a thought question. How many sins do you suppose a faithful Christian commits each day? I don't know if there's an answer to that. Because the Bible says that the faithful are not sinning more and more that grace may abound, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. But we also understand that the faithful Christian will sin sometime, 1 John 1, 8. That verse says to the faithful, and he's talking to us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I'll draw up a typical day where this individual who is trying their hardest not to sin, that's their lifestyle, stumbles into two sins throughout the duration of their whole day. And is that fair? I think that is a pretty realistic uh, day of a faithful person. They might slip up twice in one day. Have you ever slipped up more than twice in one day? Sometimes maybe you have a good day, you know. So surely those who have attempted the faithful life on a regular basis, as we do, have sinned more than twice in one day. So let's say that this faithful individual has a, for lack of a better term, a pretty good day as a faithful person, two sins on this day. At 8 a.m., this faithful Christian wakes up. And let's say a temptation comes their way pretty early on in their day, and they stumble into an unplanned sin at 10 a.m. They didn't wake up saying, I'm going to sin today. I'm excited for this. At 10 a.m., they wake up. Uh, only two hours after they wake up, they sin. Violate God's law. So they did not pre-plan this sin. They did not intend to sin, but they mess up. We do that all the time. Maybe he or she has an unfaithful moment at work, has a sinful thought or a prideful thought, or says something to somebody. 
But then at 11 a.m., they get to thinking about what they just did an hour ago. Been weighing on their conscience a little. You know, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. And they go to God in prayer. And they ask for forgiveness. And they talk to God about the sin, like we're supposed to. Then at 1 o'clock, let's say that this faithful individual commits their second sin of the day, whatever it might be. But perhaps then they don't think about the severity of what they've done until much later on in the day than just an hour. So let's say this individual gets busy or they're, they're distracted at work after they've sinned this second time. And they lead a righteous walk the rest of the day, being a Christian, living their life, being righteous towards people, having pure thoughts. And they're not trying to sin. And they don't stumble anymore after one o'clock. So only two sins in one day. Some might say, well, that's not bad. Then nighttime rolls around. And what do most faithful Christians typically do before they go to sleep at night? Well, they say a prayer before bed, thanking God for the day, petitioning him a request. I mean, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You're praying all the time. Um, and then what do you do? Repent of any sins that you can think of throughout your day. And so this faithful Christian gets to thinking about his day and remembers this sin at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And at 11 p.m. at night, he admits his wrong to God like he's supposed to. He repents. He asks God for forgiveness. Then he goes to bed at midnight. And by the way, have you ever had a day that looks about like the one that we just mentioned? Where you think back on your day when nighttime rolls around and you evaluate your day, you evaluate any sins that you've done that day, and you're talking to God, you're thinking about your spiritual walk, and then you can pinpoint, yes, I sinned earlier. I can tell you the time I sinned, and now I realize I probably should have prayed to God sooner than I even did. So I know that I do that quite often. And sometimes laying there in my bed, I think back over my day, and I can pinpoint something I sinned in earlier that day, so I admit the sin, I repent for God, I ask him for forgiveness. So in this example, I want you to think about some things. So we have a faithful Christian who tried their very best to uphold God's standard during their day. We would call that walking in the light. And by the way, they are a Christian. They have been baptized into Christ. They're a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. They're worshiping in spirit and truth, all of these things. And so they fell short twice. And like a good Christian, they prayed to God on behalf of their sin. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Pray to God, perhaps this sin will be forgiven you. They confessed, or they admitted their wrong. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. They asked God to forgive them. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in this lifestyle. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. But now, with regards to this mentality, under discussion of bouncing back and forth from darkness to light, darkness to light, let's do a little bit of figuring con considering this illustration. If a faithful Christian sins, and they are, in a, are they in a lost condition up until they pray, ask for repentance, admitting their sins? In the day where this faithful individual tried his best and slipped up two times, some might argue that he was lost from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Then he was lost between 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. He was lost each time he sinned up until he prayed and repented. So here you have, I want you to think about, a 16-hour day, 16 waking hours, 8 a.m. to midnight. And let me ask you, how many hours did this faithful Christian spend saved? You gotta do some math, Lorraine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, how many hours did he spend saved? How many hours did he spend lost according to this day? Well, according to the method at hand, he was lost for 11 hours of 16. He was saved for five hours. That is, he spent 68% of his waking day being lost as a faithful Christian, as we would say. And only 31% of his day, he spent saved. Sin twice. 
And he spent almost 70% of his day lost as a faithful Christian. And yet we sing blessed assurance about this model. Some would call this example a good day in the life of a faithful Christian. Well, I would hate to see how much worse it would be if we sinned more than twice. Or if perhaps we had a sin of ignorance that we didn't know about, we didn't pray about. So I want you to consider that if this is fundamentally the way that it works, faithful people are often spending more time in the darkness than they are in the light. That you might spend several hours of your day, if you sin more than once, more than twice, out of Christ. I might add, let us hope that we pass on to the next life during one of these saved segments. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll get hit by a car in the five hours that we are saved versus the 11 hours that we didn't have the blood of Christ. So according to our example, I would hope to die during that time frame. So the question is, is this fundamentally the way that it works? I believe the answer is no. We answer this question as we answer it. I have five points I want you to think about regarding how the blood of Jesus Christ covers the life of a faithful Christian so long as they are categorized actually as faithful. We could do a whole lesson on what it means to be faithful. I think we know what it means to be faithful. So yes, it involves our command to admit wrongs before God continually, regularly, to repent and to pray. But primarily it involves whether or not we are living the faithful life, the faithful lifestyle. Five points, I want you to consider them with me. Number one, we'll put it this way. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 teaches that Christ's blood covers the entire day of a faithful Christian. Morning, noon, and night, so long as they are walking in the light. And by the way, if they're not walking in the light, then they're not a faithful Christian. So a faithful Christian means a Christian walking in the light. That's what it means. So starting in verse 6 of that chapter, John writes to Christians this important twofold principle, and he says, Christians, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, that's a lifestyle, we lie and we do not practice the truth. That is, if we're living the wicked life, claiming to fellowship God, we're just deceiving ourselves over here in the darkness, right? We're on this side of the podium, actually. Verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let me read the major point of that verse again. If we walk in light, the blood cleanses us from all sin. The Greek renders it this way. If we keep on walking in the light, the faithful lifestyle, the blood keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Some have called it a continual cleansing, a windshield wiper of faith. A, a, a cleansing windshield wiper, I suppose you could say. So listen, if your life is categorized as walking in light, as a faithful Christian, what promise is given to you so long as you remain in that category? The continual cleansing. Right? You keep being cleansed continually of every sin you do commit while trying and walking in the light, so long as you keep doing what? Walking in the light. The condition here is so important to understand of what it means to walk in the light. Somebody says, but hold on, because verse 9 talks about us admitting our sins to God as a faithful Christian, doesn't it? And that plays a part in our continual cleansing. I agree. Point number two. Repentance as a Christian, confessing sin and prayer to God is part of walking in the light. And I'll add this, if we walk in light, we will remain continually cleansed. Okay, picture walking in the light up here as a broad sphere which summarizes the whole faithful walk. And these three things fit into that bubble, repentance, admitting sin, and prayer for your sin. Wayne Jackson rendered, rendered 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 this way. He says, if we make it a practice to confess our sins, then the Lord will be faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. So notice the idea of making it a practice, making it part of your daily life. When you slip, you admit. When you slip or you do something that you know is wrong, you admit that you have done wrong. You don't try to cover it up. You don't try to pretend it didn't happen. You fess up. You keep walking. The faithful Christian makes it a practice. 
The faithful Christian makes it their way of life to admit when they've fallen short. If we look at our illustration, uh, this faithful brother slipped into two sins, and two times this day he sinned. And within the duration of a day, he made confession of both of them. And he repented before God. He prayed. That, I'm asserting to you, is the lifestyle of a faithful Christian. God says, I've got you covered so long as you live that life. Why? Because you're walking in the light. And you sinned. Where did you sin? Walking in the light. It's not a lifestyle. You look at the book of 1 John, and it's talking about the lifestyle of darkness, not individual isolated acts of darkness. Okay? If you're walking in the light, I'll keep cleansing you. I'll keep you cleansed from all sin. Well, what sin? If, you don't, if there's no sin in the light, how can you keep being cleansed of any sin? You sin while you're in the light. But they're mistakes. It's not, a, it's not a course of sin. It's an individual, isolated act of sin, and you keep moving on. So know this faithful Christian does not go about sinning deliberately, pre-planning to sin, premeditating sin. Their goal is to follow the faithful. St- I mean, is God looking at if we're trying or not? Sure, he's looking at if we're trying. That's part of being faithful. So we're following the standard to the very best of our ability. Uh, that defines someone walking in light. But when we do sin, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, we have an advocate right there with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So that, that we're, what we're talking about is the, a privilege of being a faithful Christian. And it's only a privilege to the faithful. You maintain the blood so long as you walk in life. It's a Christian willing to admit their wrongs, make confession to God regularly, have sorrow over your sin when you fall short, and move on. And notice uh, that the Christian walking in the light, as we said before, is the one who uh, is the one who is said to sin. The Christian in the light has sinned. It says, if we in the light say we don't have sin, we make him. Do we sin in the light? Yeah, we have sin in the light, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And we're, uh, in, we're cleansed as long as we're in the light. So if we tried to describe biblically what it means to walk in the light, what are some things you might put on your list? Here's probably some things that I might put on my list, just to keep it very short. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, all our strength and mind. First and greatest command. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. We must attempt to obey every command to the very best of our ability, not neglecting ones that we know that are in the Bible. We must not lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, fornication, etc., etc. But how about this one? When we sin, we repent, confess our sins, and we pray. Is that not a component of walking in the light? Yes, it is. And think about this. If you live a lifestyle where you slip up and sin sometimes, but you don't make it a regular practice, to admit your wrongs before God, or say that you just stop admitting your wrongs before God and your lifestyle, are you walking in the light any longer? No. So there's no walking in light if you neglect a lifestyle of admitting sins and confessing and praying to God. So God says, if you'll walk in the light, which includes regular repentance, regular confession of sins, regular prayer when you fall, then I'll keep you cleansed continually the blood, won't, the, the, the blood is on your record. It'll keep you cleansed as you sin. So that means the faithful man in our illustration will remain in contact with the blood of Christ not only in the minutes and hours after he confesses his sins in prayer, but also throughout the duration of his day. Okay, you see, because God is looking at the whole day, the duration of your life, not just the portions of, of it where you sin in order to decipher your faithfulness. And this man is covered so long as he maintains the faithful lifestyle, which includes regular admitting of sins when we fall short. So God is not just looking at slip-ups. He's also looking at the lifestyle you're living, of faithfulness, between all of your slip-ups. He's looking at, at your heart of the individuals who are confessing their wrongs when they realize they've sinned. Now, point number three, I want you to get this one. I want to put it up here this way. For one walking in light, repentance, confession of sins, 
and prayer are not meant to regain the blood that you've lost, but it helps you to keep possession of the blood you already have. I want to say it again. Repentance, confession of sins, and prayers are not meant to regain the blood that you've lost, but it helps you to keep possession of the blood you already have. That that's, goes for every item of walking in the light. Go through all of God's commands. right? It's sort of like our duty to assemble on the first day of the week or to study our Bibles regularly. Like, right? These, these tasks don't put us back in the light, but they keep us in the light. It maintains the faithful lifestyle as we live. So confessing your sins helps you to maintain contact with the blood so that you don't lose it, which you gained where? At baptism. You gained access to this awesome continual cleansing at baptism. It's not that you lose the cleansing. Oh, I lost the blood of Christ because I sinned. No, you still have the cleansing. It's not that you're losing it every time, forfeiting the the blood and then regaining the blood back when you repent. No, you had the blood the whole time, as long as you're living as a faithful Christian. 1 John chapter 1, and verse 7 teaches that the Christian possesses the cleansing throughout the duration of their day, throughout the duration of their life. And when we sin, the blood is there to cleanse us right away, so long as we're classified as walking in the light. But what if a Christian, we'll just add this, what if a Christian changes their whole course of life? What if they stop worshiping God? What if they continue in secret sin, still coming to service, but they're just sinning on the side, knowing it's wrong, and they continue in that? What if they refuse to repent about these things? Then, is the blood taken away? Yes, it is. Well, why? Because they're not meeting the condition anymore of walking in the light. They've changed. Consider, how, uh, consider with me how the Greek renders Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. The Hebrew writer says, for if we, and in the Greek says, if we go on sinning willfully, continue down this path, if we just keep on sin, I'm going to sin all the time, and I'm not going to stop, I'm not sorry about it. If we go on sinning willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. This verse is talking about someone who shifts their lifestyle to practice sin continuously and repetitively. They're not trying anymore to walk in the light. They know what they're doing is wrong, and they keep doing it, and they persist in a lifestyle of willful sin. So this is not a verse talking about a Christian who in their weakness stumbles every now and again. This verse is talking about walking in darkness. You might call it apostasy. If you walk in darkness, you forfeit the cleansing. This verse could say, if you lead a lifestyle of willful sin, then you forfeit your sacrifice. God will not keep cleansing someone who is sinning more and more that grace may abound, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. So who is this blessed promise that we're talking about for the faithful Christian? Right? Not the unfaithful Christian. Now number four. Let me show you a parallel passage of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 teaches the same thing, that the faithful child of God is not condemned. Notice again that I said the faithful child of God. The passage reads this way. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now let's break this down. First, there is therefore now no condemnation to everybody everywhere. No. All right, look at the limiting, restrictive phrases. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, is that everybody in Christ Jesus? Not necessarily so, because sometimes in those inside the body of Christ, the church, deliberately pursue a course of sin and they fall. So what then? There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, What's the rest say? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Do you realize that's the exact same promise John gave in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 7, just different words. What, how, would, how would John describe walking according to the flesh? Well, he would call it walking in darkness. How would John describe uh, walking according to the Spirit? He'd call it walking in the light. So Paul here is saying no one is condemned who, number one, is in Christ Jesus, 
You have to meet that. How do you get there? Through obeying the gospel, baptism. But then number two, no one is condemned in Christ who lives a faithful life. Who lives a faithful lifestyle, who does not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. No one who lives their life this way is going to go to hell. No one is condemned who lives the lifestyle of the faithful while confessing and admitting their wrongs regularly. There's one more major passage I want you to think about this morning, and then we'll make a little bit more application as we close. Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Put a star next to this one. Romans chapter 4 and verse 8 teaches that sin never touches the record of a faithful Christian. Again, I don't keep saying, I said a faithful Christian. That is one walking in the light, one who walks not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, talks about David in the Old Testament, who was accounted righteous in the same fashion that we are today. David simply lived a faithful life. And God kept cleansing him because he walked by faith. Paul writes about such individuals as David, and he said his faith is accounted for righteousness. That is, even though he's not righteous, he's now accounted righteous because he's been faithful. Because he's being faithful, God will credit him as being righteous. Verse 6, he said, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, David said, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And if you walk away with any verse today, walk away with this one. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. To whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So we notice a few things here about why David was so happy. He said, blessed is a man about this. Number one, David had the forgiveness of sins. Even though he had sinned before God, God justified him and accredited him in his account with righteousness. Number two, David said, my sins are covered. That is, there were sins I committed before that belong on my record. They should be there, but God covered them. He forgave the sins of my past. But now listen to number three very carefully. David said, the Lord will not impute sin to me. Well, what was David's condition under the Old Testament system so that the Lord would not impute sin to him walking in the light? The faithful lifestyle. So as long as David remained faithful, the Lord would not impute his sin. The Lord would not impute his sins against him when he fell short. The word impute, I think, is important to understand. It means to mark up against put a tally down against somebody to accredit something. So the idea is David would sin in his faithful life sometimes, right? As we all do, he would, he would sin, but God would not count David's sin against him as he walked in the light. God would not mark up David's sin against him as he walked in the light. God would not count sin toward David's record as he walked in the light. Sin was not imputed to him. Was he sinning sometimes? Yes. Was it imputed to him? No. David would commit sin, yes, but not one of those sins would be counted on his record. It's as if he had, wasn't even sinning at all because his sins were continually covered. And I want to note, I want you to note an excellent cross reference to this concept regarding the life of faithful David to whom the Lord would not impute sin. Make special note of 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 5 with regards to the life of David. We talked about this a lot in, his, in the David series that we did. It, said, it says, Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. I want you to consider it this way. David walked in light, lived faithfully, and he was covered by grace all the days of his life, except during the one time frame. 
when David entirely left faith and was found in a spiritually apostate state in the eyes of God in the ordeal with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. During this time frame of sin, what the New Testament would call David walked in darkness, David stopped meeting the conditions of his grace. And it couldn't be said during that time period that it wouldn't have been imputed to him. David not only messed up, but he premeditated several sins. He ceased from trying to be faithful at that time. He was trying to cover it up, wasn't he? And he'd sinned more. And he sinned more. And it started a cycle. And during that time period, the Bible indicates that David left God spiritually. John would say during this time frame, David was no longer walking in the light. But he was walking in darkness. Of course, we know that David finally repented. And he was restored. And he was covered again. But with that in mind, listen to what God just said about the rest of his life. And think about what God said about the rest of his life. God said, David never sinned outside of, these other, outside of the events with David and Bathsheba. Is that what he said? Did David never sin outside of the events of David and Bathsheba? No. Right? David sinned. I could list you know, the sin of the, uh, of, of, uh, what's it called? The, um, census. Census. The sin of the census. We have another sin. Certainly the, the rest of the sins during his life. But listen to what God said. David did right in my sight. David always pursued faithfulness to all my commands other than during this ordeal concerning Uriah the Hittite when he walked in darkness. And he never departed from the faithful walk. He never did. He never bounced out of my grace other than during that time frame. He was covered the rest of his days. The implication is None of the other sins of David's life that were committed in the light were ever imputed to his record as he lived faithfully, as he confessed his sins regularly, whereas in this time period of darkness, he tried to cover them up. He didn't admit them. He didn't pray to God, and he tried to get, get away with it. All, all the other times in his life, he was regularly confessing his sins. He was regularly telling God, I know my worthlessness. I know I sin. I, he recognized it. And he lived as best as he could. God had him covered. So the implication is, if David had died when he was 20, he would have been saved. If David would have died when he was 30, he would have been saved. If David would have died when he was 50 or 60, he would have been saved. And all the time in between, other than when he sinned in the time frame with Bathsheba. And Uriah the Hittite. The only time that would have given him any sort of spiritual danger where he left was during that apostasy. And he tried to cover it all up. So all the other times David was found in a faithful state. And whenever David did slip, slip up, he would make it a practice to confess his sins. He would have a right heart with God. And God was not imputing any sin to his record as he was faithful. Romans chapter 4, Paul says this blessed state that David talks about is available to Christians. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So let's talk again about the faithful Christian in our illustration this morning. 8 a.m. He wakes up covered by the grace of God because he was previously baptized into Christ. And then, since then, he's been living the faithful life. 10 a.m. in his human weakness in imperfection, he stumbles into sin. And from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., whereas the other mentality says that he has no hope until he says the prayer, biblically, we must understand that God is not imputing any sin to this man's record because of the faithful lifestyle he's currently living. And so at 11 a.m., when it rolls around, this man confesses that he's done wrong in a prayer to God, which is cru crucial for him being found in the category of walking in the light. Then one o'clock rolls around and he slips up again. And then later that night, he confesses his sin before the Father. I'm asserting to you that as long as his life remains in the light, the category of his life, and he does not depart into a lifestyle of darkness, that man is in a safe condition at 10 a.m. He's in a safe condition at 1 p.m., He's in a safe condition at midnight and all the time in between because the Lord is not imputing sins while he walks in the light. 
There is no condemnation to that man, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. All of his imperfections are continually cleansed, 1 John 1, 7, because he's walking in light. He's a blessed man because the Lord is not imputing his sins, Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 says to the faithful, your life is hidden with Christ and God. So as long as you are categorized as faithful, you're covered, you're good. Just keep walking in the light, keep confessing your sins, keep trying your hardest, and this implies that we can live years, years in the light without falling from the light if you just keep admitting your sins and walking in light. I think sometimes we just think, I've been out of the light 60 times in the past four weeks. But the Bible would say, if you are actually falling in this category, you haven't even left the light. And the Lord's not imputing the sins when you do fall short. The book of First John was written to address uh, this exact way of thinking, where we feel condemned all the time. And he was trying to get us to realize you're not condemned all the time when you're actually walking in the light. You shouldn't have to be miserable uh, where, where we feel condemned because we fall short sometimes. John said, I've written these things that your joy may be full. First John 1, 4. You shouldn't have to feel, feel miserable when you understand what we just talked about. He said, I've written these things that you may know you have eternal life. First John chapter 5, verse 13. You can know you have eternal life. He said to the faithful, I'm letting you know your sins are forgiven. I'm letting you know you've overcome the wicked one. And lastly, he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. He doesn't touch us for a second. He tempts us. But because of this system, we can have confidence. I want to close the lesson with two quick misapplications that some could take from this lesson if they take it the wrong way. Do not walk away from this lesson and say either of these two things. Number one, do not say, well, I guess I don't have to confess my sins in repentance and prayer because I'm saved without it. No, you're not. Don't say, well, Travis said I could just cover it at night so I won't pray to God if I realize I've sinned and it's only 10 o'clock. I'll just do it at night before I go. No, pray. Don't, don't stop praying. Don't, if you realize you sin, pray right away. Right? If you need to walk away at work, and do, that's the lifestyle. But if we take this lesson and think that we can just stop confessing our sins when we fall short, then you miss the whole point. Right? God is judging our faithfulness partially based off of, primarily based off of our attitude to admit when we've messed up. And Christians won't make it to heaven if we stop admitting and confessing our sins and praying to God about them. Because why? Then you'll be categorized as walking in darkness. We have to have an attitude, I've done wrong, I admit this wrong, I admit that wrong, admit specific sins. Uh, so First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we go about confessing our sins, that continual action, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, no, number two, lastly, don't let anybody say this. Well, I guess this means I can just sin more because God doesn't impute sin to my account. That's awesome, I can just sin more. No, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 says, For if we go on sinning willfully, you forfeit the sacrifice for your sin. You can't do that and be found in light. So no, hopefully we understand fully the implication that if we plan to sin more because of God's grace, we will forfeit the blood that saves us. God will not keep cleansing a person who seeks to use his grace as a freebie, a license to sin. We will not fool God with that lifestyle. But if we walk within the wonderful conditions of his grace, then maybe we'll have some confidence in our salvation, realizing that Jesus' blood covers the faithful individual and that we can just keep walking in the light. I wanted to throw the verse up here, 1 John chapter 3. It says, if your heart condemns you, What's it say? God is greater than your heart. We understand sometimes we condemn ourselves when we ought not to even condemn ourselves. It says God knows all things. God knows this scenario. He knows if you've been walking in the light. Sometimes we condemn ourselves when we actually shouldn't. And so in that state, the Lord will not impute sin if we keep walking in the light. So that's our lesson for today.
And if you have more questions, we can talk about it later. Um, but the Bible says in order to get into this grace and this implication of how you can walk in the light all the days of your life, the Bible says that's not even going to work if you don't do this first. The Bible says you have to get in Christ and then live that way. You've got to hear the gospel. Believe the gospel about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins. Repent of your sins. Confess them before men. Be baptized, immersed in water. Come up out of that water, a brand new creature, ready to walk in this light that we've been talking about. And you have access to the continual cleansing so long as you walk in the light. So if anybody wants to come, uh, needs to come for any reason of repentance or prayers, please come while we stand and sing. While Jesus.